Welcome to Season 2, Episode 4 of Discussions with the Social Social Worker. Our guest, Elise Mandich, is helping us debunk some common social work myths, and she shares what it is like to be a high school school social worker during a pandemic. Elise is a licensed clinical social worker in sunny Southern California. She currently works as a school social worker in a high school and has experience working as an emergency response investigator for Child Protective Services. Elise has a passion for all things mental health, nostalgia, and cultivating compassion. Between her own experiences and her ability to connect with others, she considers herself pretty damn relatable. Check Elise out on Instagram at that relatable social worker. Please welcome Elise Mandich. Hey y'all, it's Sarah, the social social worker. Thanks for joining me again for another awesome discussion with Elise Mandich at that relatable social worker on Instagram. And she is a licensed clinical social worker. And today we'll be debunking myths about being a social worker working for CPS and also talking about her journey to becoming a licensed clinical social worker. Thank you so much for being here, Elise. Hi, thanks for having me and hello everybody. So um, like Sarah said, my name's Elise Mandich and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I'm currently working as a high school social worker, but um, I would say I'm more at this point an expert in working for child welfare services. That was my niche for a long time. So I'm excited to kind of jump in and debunk some of this stuff. We're so happy to have you here. So I put together a list, five things, um, but the top four that I'm really wanting to hear about go like this. So number one, social workers take people's children away. Yes, that is probably the biggest myth that there is. I think, and for anybody going into social work, I think that's everybody's fear saying like, oh, I'm a social worker because anybody that's not in the mental health field just assumes that social work, one, is child protective services work, and two, that the myth is that we just take children away. Um, I wish I had like the actual statistics, but it's so far from the truth. Like the whole purpose and the mission behind child welfare services or child protective services, Department of Chan Children and Family Services, there's so many different names for it, is to really preserve families. And when children are removed, the whole purpose is to reunify them back with their families when they're safe. Um, I believe, and I'm just going to kind of like say, take this with a grain of salt, the statistics when I worked, um, I was working in San Diego County for Child Welfare Services, it was like 2% or 3% of the investigations that we had two to three percent of those investigations resulted in the removal of children. So really, really small. So to put that into context, like for when I worked there, um, I would say my first year that I was working in investigations, I removed children from maybe, maybe seven families. And that was actually like a lot within a year. Most of my coworkers maybe didn't have more than one or two a year. Um, so definitely a big myth. Uh, it's really the whole purpose is to go out and help provide like support to families and resources and help them to create safety for their child. And so another little piece of this that I want to touch on is that when you do go out and you do have to remove a child, it's typically after you kind of gave the family an opportunity to help keep their child safe and then they were not able to do that for whatever reason that might be. But 95% of the time they have this opportunity to help create that safety. Yeah, and like I think when I, before I became a social worker, um, obviously I have family that are social workers, so I kind of knew, but the media, I mean, there was just the big documentary on Netflix, and then it, and like you watch different movies, and it's just kind of like, oh, these social workers, they're not, they're not like these kind people, or they're just bringing everybody down with them and that's totally not true obviously right. you're a ray of sunshine so i <laughs> thank you for debunking myth number one yes okay so myth number two uh working in child welfare or social workers in general social workers give out handouts yeah i i really like this one because um i'm trying to think of like the joke that there's out there right it's like how many, how many social workers does it take to change somebody? 
or something like that. And it's like one, but they have to want to change. Um, I love this. And I think it aligns with that myth so much because yeah, we don't just go out. I don't have a magic wand to one, make everything better. And two, I definitely don't just like, here you go. Like, this is for you. Like everything's better. Like you have to put in the work. And I think that's, um, especially in child welfare, I think it's a little bit harder. It kind of goes against the grain of like meeting people where they're at for change because when it comes to safety, like safety kind of trumps you, you wanting to change. Um, it's kind of like you have to do this. And so they have to really find some of that like internal motivation, intrinsic motivation to get themselves on that path. But we're really there to like, okay, here's like the road. We really would like to guide you here, but like they have to do the navigating, you know? So I think that that's, it's definitely a big myth that's out there that I hope people realize like they have the power to do it themselves, you know, like you don't, and you don't want somebody else to do that work for you. Very, very true. And I know, I mean, social workers too, like I, or just people seeing the profession of social work, I think they think like, oh, you can fix the problem. So I'm going to present it to you. And then they just think like, like you said, a magic wand. But also social workers don't have a lot of resources. So Mm -hmm. it's not like we have so much money to just be like, okay, I could pay your rent. I could buy you groceries, pay off Mm -hmm. your car. Like if we had all that money, then we wouldn't need social workers because everybody would be fine. Right. Right. So number three, child welfare social workers only work with poor people. I really like this one. Um, Again, just kind of coming back to my experience. So I worked, um, for those of you familiar with California and San Diego County, I was in North County, San Diego. um, And it was a really cool experience because I was working with some of the poorest parts of North County and also some of the like richest parts. And I will tell you that I think there is as much abuse in wealthy families as there is in low socioeconomic families. The difference is a lot of the times the reporting, right? So if I live in an apartment with people all around me who can hear and see everything that's going on inside my little walls, of course that's going to get reported more often to the police, to child welfare. And then if I'm in this, And I'm just going to speak on the extremes. If I'm in this mansion in the middle of nowhere with nobody around me, nobody can hear or see anything I'm doing. So they don't really know what's happening within those walls unless a child is then reporting it to a mandated reporter. Um, But I would say some of my, honestly, some of my more serious investigations often came from wealthier families. So I think it's important to kind of understand like abuse doesn't discriminate. And those challenges that we experience, they're there everywhere. Um, I think it's really just kind of comes down to like who's reporting and same thing. Like if you and kind of bring it to bias a little bit, if I go into a hospital, maybe I present well and my addiction looks very different, but somebody else who maybe doesn't present as well and maybe their addiction, let's just say, um, somebody who's wealthy is abusing, um, like pain medication, And then we have somebody else who's maybe not wealthy, who's abusing methamphetamines. You still have the same substance abuse issue, the concern of driving your children under the influence, caring for your children under the influence. That's all the same. But how those people present, the person on the other end that's reporting that may look at the person with money and say, like, this just, this looks okay. Like, I'm sure maybe I can just help them or connect them here and may not report where the other person, they're like, this is a concern, right? So I think that bias definitely comes into play. And also, I should say, you're the first social worker I've met from California. So, thank you for being here. We're, like, on totally opposite ends of the coast, but that is really cool. And number four, social workers live to interfere in other people's lives. Repeat that one more time for me. Uh, Social workers interfere with other people's lives. Yeah. I mean, I definitely will say, like, do we kind of like show up like, Hey, I'm like here in your life now. Yeah. But ultimately I think so often like families recognize maybe they're not happy when, especially from child welfare, like they're not happy when that social worker shows up at their door. Right. Or finds out that they talk to their kids at school as a parent. Like I can totally understand like if the tables were turned, even now being a social worker, having worked for child welfare, I would still be frustrated. Right. But 
ultimately, I think people realize it's kind of like this, in a way, involuntary, like, scooch into your life to be like, hey, here's maybe some things that you didn't recognize or maybe you recognize were a problem and I want to help you kind of go down this path that might help create a little more safety for you and your family. And so sometimes it is more preventative, right? Like if we keep this problem going, you're really looking at this being a much worse situation. Like me knocking on your door is very minimal to what this could be. And so how can we help you to establish safety and increase those protective factors and safety network, right, to get everything safe and situated? Um, a little story around that, because I think this is like just kind of goes to show, but there was a, a coworker of mine who I worked with at Child Welfare, who's actually now in the district I work in now, so it's been fun. So we were talking last night about this removal that she had done. I'd gone out with her. It was her first removal, and it was really hard, and she was, you know, explaining to the family what was happening. They were obviously upset, and she was very calm, and she just said, I, I know you. I know you guys can put in the work. I know you guys can do this. And... Um, in the meantime, after that had happened, I had stopped working for the county, you know, stopped really hearing about the stories. And last night she was telling me, like, did I ever tell you I went to their reunification hearing? So about a year later, she went to the hearing and showed up. And the family was actually really thankful for her. And so it took time, and I'm sure it took a lot of therapy and processing to really recognize, like, hey, you were the mirror I didn't want to look in. But, like, thank you, and thank you for helping my family. And so even though maybe initially they saw it as like an interference, I think ultimately it became a big thank you, which is huge, especially for child welfare workers <laughs> to get that. So that was really cool. Yeah. I mean, also social workers, they also have lives of their own. So it's not like they live, breathe and eat to, to go and see what you're doing and all those things. But like you said, they're, they're there for a purpose to help you be the best version of yourself and to help you keep your family together. So thank you for touching on that topic. I really yeah. appreciate it. Before we move on, I know that you have a lot of experience within the child welfare realm. What are some tips for people who might be watching to like kind of prevent that burnout from being in like emotional situations if you do have to remove a child or you're working with difficult families? So, and I'll kind of touch a little bit on, like when I went to graduate school, I was going into getting my master's in social work with like the sole purpose of like making child welfare services like my career. I like loved it. I loved my, like I had volunteered there at the, before I went into grad school and really wanted to make this like my life. And so after graduating and I started working there, like you kind of, you very quickly realize it's really challenging. Um, and I mean the kind of what you're talking about, like what you see, what you're experiencing, like that's one aspect of it. But the others are like the crazy timelines and policies that go around this that, you know, you always wonder if the people creating these timelines, like, have you ever like been in this situation? Like, so it's a lot. Um, and I think, I kind of always said like in order to be a really good worker there, you really are like kind of living and breathing it a little bit. Um, that was kind of my take on it. Like if I wanted to continue giving a hundred percent to this, there was almost like a shift in my personal life. Um, so at the time when I started, I didn't have kids. Uh, at the, I was engaged and my husband worked like late in restaurants. So it kind of worked. It was like conducive to what we had going on. Um, but I think what really helped me during that time was like, honestly, kind of trying to turn it off when I left. So like I was commuting about an hour each way. So on my drive home, listening to music, listening to podcasts, like calling another coworker, crying it out, venting it out, whatever I needed to do to like, to leave that as much as I could there and pick it back up in the morning. Um, because you know, no matter what we're human and we're going to take some of that home. So like the really, if I had a removal, like I still will never forget the, the sentence that this little boy said, the, my first removal in the car, he was like crying and he was like, my heart hurts. And that like stays with me. And that's, I remember that night I just like kept hearing him say that. So no matter what you're taking some of that home. And I think it's just like any of our own difficult feelings, like finding a way to like sit with it and just kind of like accept it. And then what do I need to do to take care of myself in this situation? And, and then after I had kids, it, it kind of shifted to like, okay, this is, 
and we'll get into that, but why I ended up shifting careers. So now you, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that experience with us and kind of giving us some tips um, and advice and some insight, but now you are a high school school social worker. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So I know that there's like this fifth myth that I'm kind of curious about, but I, I want to hear kind of like your journey and how it got you to becoming a school social worker. But my last myth is social workers are doomed to a lifetime of stress <laughs> and exhaustion. <laughs> I think that honestly, we are doomed to that if we don't set boundaries. Like I did not set boundaries in the beginning and I found myself feeling really burnt out. Like how do people do this? And I think that's where unfortunately you get that stereotype of bad social workers, right? So like this burnout frumpy social worker that's knocking on your door, like, yeah, they probably haven't been taking care of themselves. And so how do you set those boundaries? Um, I, you often had to bring work home with child welfare. I never worked in my bed. I would not check emails. Like even now in the school setting, I don't check emails when I get home from work. Like I, when work is done, work is done. Yep. Um, so I really have to like set that. But I do think, yeah, boundaries and I'm trying to like, child welfare is hard. Like I'll just be completely honest. It's really hard. And the people that I know that are still in it, um, you almost have to like continue shifting and like changing changing your boundaries, changing what you're willing to participate in because there's a lot of like extra work that you can do. So like maybe you cut back on being the liaison for something so that you have more time to breathe somewhere else. So I think it's just like constantly like going through the motions of like, okay, hey, what do I need? What, what can I give up? What do I need to take? Um, and you need to definitely get comfortable doing that. But no, I don't think we're doomed. I think that oftentimes, like, so much of this stuff actually re-energizes us. And, you know, as long as you find your support people, and, like, Instagram has been great for that. There's so many of us on there that I think you just get to, like, see other people's journeys and connect and learn different skills. And then you kind of realize, like, oh, I'm not alone. Like, and there's a lot of resources out there for us. But it's definitely one of those, like, you got to practice what you preach, you know? Like, I'll sit there and make a post on boundaries, and then I'm like, oh, but am I doing this? Or am I taking care of myself? So. Yes. Social work can be crazy, but I think that it's a, it, you're a wonderful uh, example and role model of how it is, it is okay to transition careers, one, but also that there's so much more in social work than, like you said, being in child welfare. So now that you're in the high school setting, you're in LCSW, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how, what your journey looked like um, and what people on a similar path can expect. Okay. Um, so I'm going to bring it back like a little bit, <laughs> um, like circa 2007, my high school year, my senior year of high school. And I shadowed a um, licensed, licensed marriage and family therapist. So that's kind of like what got me interested in the field. Um, but I think, you know, I've said this before on, on my own social media stuff that I think a lot of us in the mental health field and social work kind of come from our own experiences or somebody close to us that has had maybe some like tough experiences. And so that, you know, my own traumatic history has kind of led to where I'm at. And it got me excited. Like I didn't really know in undergrad what I wanted to do, but then once I had this internship or I guess volunteer work with child welfare services, um, that really kind of like, lit the social work fire, right? And so I went to graduate school, again, with the hopes that I was just going to work for child welfare forever, like be a supervisor and just like be so happy there. And about three years in, it, my son was about, let's see, I was pregnant actually with him. I think it's kind of when I realized like, this is not going to be me forever. So I actually went back and got my PPS credential to do a school social work while I was working full time. So it was really like a, you got to really want it if you're willing to go back to school after getting your master's. Like I had to do another internship. Um, so I was working a 410 schedule, interning on my day off technically. And um, all in the same time I was working on getting licensed. And so I got my credential and I still stuck around with the county for about two more years while I finished getting licensed. And then once I um, 
pass that test. I think it was like within a few days, I'm like, okay, like I passed what's out there. Peace out. <laughs> yeah. And so I started looking for, um, jobs that required the license. Like that was kind of important to me. Like, first of all, I love child welfare. I have wonderful things to say about it, but they pay you pennies. Um, at least at the time they did. And so I was like, okay, I'm licensed now. Like most places like this will pay you more. And I, have always kind of been against the grain of like, we're in it for the outcome, not for the income. Like, I don't agree with that. I think that we, we can still want to make money and do what we're doing. Like, I think that's, yeah, that's a whole other topic, but. Well, that's so important though. That it is, is. So important. Our work, you know, it's obviously we enjoy what we do. We wouldn't like get into it if we didn't, but our, what we do for people is just, to me, is just as important as what somebody is doing who's like architecting a bridge or doing right. infrastructure. But we're doing infrastructure from with like in a person, and I think it should be equally valued. Absolutely. And that is, I mean, a lot of the times like money is equals value in, in, in how you pay people. And so that was like an important thing for me. And so when I started looking for jobs, it was maybe a few months after I got licensed that conveniently like school social work jobs don't typically require the license. Like I, I've heard they're moving in that direction. Um, but yeah, like licensed clinical social worker came up for a school social work position and I'm like, this is it. So just a quick funny story with that, but I wanted it so bad. And the time that they offered the interview, I was like on vacation with my family um, four hours away from the interview. So I drove at three in the morning to my interview with a broken toe <laughs> <laughs> like did my interview and then went to urgent care after. And as I was driving back, they called me and offered the position. Um, but it just kind of felt like all the stars aligning, like everything was like, this is what made it so worth it. Like, even though I, you know, worked another two years after being pretty done, like I saw the light at the end of the tunnel and was able to transition there. Um, and it's been really great. This is like the best this is like the best job to have work-life balance. Like I, I have all the breaks off. So like, and I have two young kids, so I have winter break and summer break and I'm off at a decent time. Like, even though there's always crisis intervention and in social work, right? Like we're always going to have those challenges. The latest I'm usually at school or the latest I think I've been there was like maybe 8 PM, like on one or two occasions, but it's like nothing compared to like one in the morning in child welfare. Um, and yeah, it gives me time to, to focus on like other goals. So it's really opened up this like door of like, okay, like I got my license. Is there anything else that's like important to me that I want to work on? And yes. And now I have time to do it in addition to time with my family. So it's been really great. And that's extremely important. And I just, I think it's so inspiring to me to see another woman who has, is in the similar field as me and is working towards all of her goals. Uh, it's just so inspiring to like see that you are putting yourself first as a priority. And I think another whole other topic that we can have is like, sometimes we feel guilty for chasing um, after our own dreams or like if we're leaving something behind or someone behind. And I just think it's so awesome that you said, what else is out there for me? And I think that all women can take a chapter out of your book, especially myself. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So in California, I feel like every state is different with their licensing requirements. But in mm -hmm. California, what was your, um, like, what were your required hours that you had to do before you became an LCSW? Um, I'm assuming the test still had to go through, like, ASWB. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I want to say, I feel like they just shifted it too. And I, again, I don't know how, like what state to state, how that works. But I know when I was getting my hours, it was 30, I think 3,200 hours. And I want to say it just shifted to 3,000. So for like everybody getting it now, I'm like, oh, that's convenient. Nice. Uh -huh. yeah. And then the minimum amount of time, like you could not get it any sooner than two years. And I think it broke down to like 104 weeks. Um, and it took me... I want to say, let's see, I got licensed two years ago, 2018, like five years from the time I graduated. I had my hours done and then waited an entire year to take my test. Like one, I, I had had a baby in that time, but also right. like, I think I was so worried about like, 
the test itself and it's not as scary as it as I imagined it to be and there's like so many awesome study guides and material out there that like break it down for you in like five to eight weeks like it's way more manageable than I think we put in our head okay well that makes me that makes me happy I just sent in all the paperwork you have to send so nice. I'm trying to get licensed in Texas because we're moving but I sent right. in all the paperwork and I'm like dang this is more paperwork than I feel like the actual test is so yes I'm just kind of waiting to hear back now for when I can sit for my test, but. Oh, how exciting. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you. Has it, one more question, kind of about school social work, but since yeah. we've shifted to like this in-home setting, is it, is it different than uh, at being a school social work different than kind of what you expected or is it, even better being able to work with your kids virtually? It's been challenging. So it's, so we, when we went into this distant learning type of environment, it was in March or April, technically when our school went, cause it was like right when we got back from spring break. And I think my situation is a little unique. I just returned from maternity leave too. So I hadn't seen my kids since January. And so they already, for a few months, um, didn't have that support at school, filled by a school social worker. It was kind of like the counselors were helping out. Um, it's been tough, though, because normally in my office, right, let's say I'm worried about a student, and maybe there's some resistance to them wanting to meet with me. I can pull them from class two or three times and, like, let me talk to you, like, and then start to build that relationship and that rapport. And then they're like, okay, maybe this like chick does know something. Maybe like she can help me. And online, like, I don't get to like hunt you down. Like you have to like really want to meet with me. And so it's really only allowed the students that know they want the support and maybe already have an established relationship. Um, it'll be interesting this year since this is a platform we're going into and I'll be taking new students. Like, what that's going to look like. Cause again, I'm like, I'm hoping that you can still build, you know, some rapport over this, but it's definitely tough. It's hard. And they're online all day for their classes. So it's like, do they even want to engage in this after they've been sitting in front of a computer all day? Yeah, it's not, I don't think the teachers would be too happy if you just like popped your little zoom screen into the <laughs> class. <laughs> like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Can you exit out of this classroom? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think they would be happy right. about that. But you're right. I mean, you, it's it's there's not like that. And this with schools being closed in general, a lot of kids are not getting that safe place of comfort that they were getting from school mm -hmm. before. So yeah. I think we're all in a stage of transition. But I, I mean, that's that's really cool. I'm, I'm intrigued now, and I kind of want to do some more research on school social work. We'll have but to I have do, a conversation after this. <laughs> yes. So I know I said I only had five myths, but I have a six myth about school okay. social work, and that's just because I've, like, heard this in passing conversations. But school social workers only work with truancy, which I'm pretty sure is not true, but I've mm -hmm. heard people talk about that here and there, so... You know, I imagine every district functions like a little bit differently and like what they focus on, but no, like, and actually our district at this point doesn't allow us to do like home visits, which I think would be like a really important component to if there's an issue around like attendance or truancy. No, and I think ultimately maybe people are saying that because the underlying issues underneath why kids are truant, that opens up a whole other, right? Like if it's truancy, like here's this whole other scope of like what's really going on we work with all of this and maybe this is like an outcome of some of that, but actually I, I think, and maybe because I'm in a high school, it's a little different. Like once they're truant to a certain extent and after interventions, like we've tried, like if they don't have enough credits or they're not doing well, they're, they're pushed to a different school anyways. Um, no, but I try to like offer incentives and stuff like that to like keep coming. I'll give you like a shake to Jack in the box. What's your favorite Starbucks drink? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like you said, every diff district is different. Um, my background is working with refugees, and any time that the school social worker got called, it was to deal with truancy. And I was just like, oh, I didn't know social workers dealt with that, but okay, whatever. So I yeah. just thought since I'm talking to an actual school social worker that I would ask. Yeah. 
it's just one slice of the pie. Yes. So, <laughs> well, thank you for being so relatable because you are that relatable social worker. Before I let you go, two questions. One, what did you take away from today's conversation? And two, if we walk away with nothing else, what is one thing that you want viewers to take away from today? So the first one, I think, honestly, we, we preach, I preach so much, and I know I kind of touched on this already, but about boundaries. And that has been like, like, if I had to say I've had one goal of personal life goal over the last year, it's been to like really hone in on boundaries, especially around work. Um, because I'm usually the first one to be like, I'll do that project. I'll help with this. I'll stay late. I'll take that investigation at 4 p.m., you know, like knowing I'm going to be up so late. And I'm trying to not equate me giving 110% on every single thing to how good of a worker I am or how good of a social worker I am because I know that in order for me to be a good mom and a good social worker and a good friend and a good everything else, that I need to have those boundaries and that balance. And so that's like my takeaway. Like I need to practice a little more about what I'm preaching. Um, and then if anything, like what I want people to kind of take from this too is honestly, it's around child welfare. I think like even I even heard from like people in my cohort in graduate school that weren't going into child welfare. Like they even had their like perceptions of child welfare and it's like, we're all the same. Like we're all helping and understanding that even though it doesn't always clinically align with like, again, meeting people where they're at, um, we understand the stages of change and how that affects people, but safety trumps all that. And so I think it's just to really like, I guess kind of give some grace to people that are working in that field because it is harder than like any job I can ever imagine having. So it's just learning, right? The more we learn, then the more we can understand it. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Elise. And I'll make sure to put a link in the description um, with your Instagram link, that relatable social worker. And I just appreciate all the knowledge that you preach today. And you're just a wonderful role model and figure for women empowerment, for being your own person and I love everything that you put on social media so thank you again for being here thank you thank you for supporting discussions with the social social worker to stay connected and current with our content follow us on social media and subscribe to our youtube channel thanks y'all